Well, it has been a great weekend here at Faith Community Church. We have really enjoyed having Dr. Mark Farnham here with us and doing the uh, Spring Bible Conference uh, on the subject of apologetics and uh, being able to look at um, uh, our theme and uh, seeing that every believer is confident. I believe this has helped us a tremendous amount and it's uh, been a real blessing. Every time Mark speaks or teaches, I find out that we have more in common. Uh, it's pretty amazing, but he'll tell you we, we crossed paths when we were kids, basically, uh, although I'm a little bit older than he is. Uh, but uh, up on Cape Cod, we cross paths. It's kind of um, interesting. Mark is from Connecticut, so he's from New England. Uh, I found out that we were both uh, uh, born into Catholic families in the sense that big Catholic families and police and firemen, and we've got the police uh, pretty well covered um, from our family. And we were both saved at the age of seven years old, so that's pretty neat. And we were both called into ministry at the age of 12. We knew we were going to be serving the Lord full time at the age of 12. Now, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? That is really amazing. We must have been drinking the same water, brother. <laughs> but it's been a blessing. It really has been a blessing. And uh, we've covered some amazing topics and been able to uh, uh, really learn a great deal. And I know uh, this session, uh, dealing with pr probably the number one question that's asked, if God is uh, all loving and if he's at the same time all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist in the world? Great question. Mark's going to be addressing that this morning. Uh, I listened to uh, the message in the first service and uh, just dealing with John chapter 11 and just what a blessing it was to be able to look at John chapter 11 in a different way and understand the heart of God. And so I know this will be a blessing to you, but I want to just thank Mark for coming, uh, spending time away from his family uh, to be with us these three days. It's really been a, a benefit to us. And uh, I trust that um, you will avail yourselves of some of the books that are listed on the back of your, uh, the syllabus. If you were here this week and you got that, uh, if not, uh, Mark has a website as well, and you can go to his website uh, and uh, be able to correspond with him actually through that method as well. Do I'm going to ask Mark to come and uh, bring us this uh, final session here this weekend. Thank you, Kevin. It is a joy to be here this weekend. I have enjoyed my time here so much. I've only been down in this area once or twice before, and uh, last night we had a chance to go downtown to Annapolis, which was a thrill to me just to see the Naval Academy in such a neat city. Where I pastored in New London, Connecticut, was right across the river from the nuclear submarine base in Groton, Connecticut, so I had a number of junior officers in my in my church who are Annapolis grads, and uh, so I thought, I always want to get down there and see that. We had a chance to see the beautiful campus, mostly from a distance, because we didn't have security clearance. But, uh, you know, if some of you can get me in sometime, let me know. But uh, we've enjoyed our time here this weekend, and uh, Kevin and I first met each other, as he said, on the beach in Cape Cod, because my younger sister was friends with his younger sister, and then we went to the same seminary years apart, because he's much older than I am. <laughs> Um, and uh, just chance, chance meetings through the year, so it's really nice to spend time with him and Karen this weekend, and we're thankful for the hospitality, thankful for your interest in the topic. We had a great weekend, and as I mentioned uh, on Friday night, this subject of defending your faith, gaining confidence in what you believe, knowing how to answer those who ask questions to us and raise objections, is found in 1 Peter 3, where we're all commanded to prepare ourselves, always being preparing, prepared to give an answer to those who ask us for the reason for the hope that's in us. And um, while most of the books have sold, I apparently lacked faith enough that you would buy many books. Every book out there you can buy for the same price on Amazon. So if you get a chance to look at the, uh, the handouts, the last two pages are about recommendation probably about 50 or 75 books that I've read parts or most of all of them, and uh, I can recommend them to you in different topics. Or you can go to my website. There's not much there, quite frankly. Uh, it's mostly for doing conferences, but I think I give recommend, recommended resources there. Some podcasts will be going up in the next few weeks. Uh, but I want to encourage you to continue to pursue effectively engaging unbelievers with the gospel. And the number one objection that's raised uh, is the question of evil and suffering in the world. How can there be an all-powerful, all-loving God when there's so much evil and suffering? 
In fact, skeptics through the ages have said, if someone were to come here from outer space and want to know what this world is all about, I would take them to see the rampant suffering in our world and then tell them this is why people are losing their faith in God because of the nature of suffering. If you were to go up to central Pennsylvania, just west of Harrisburg, there's a church out in the middle of the country called Church of the Living Christ. And I was doing a conference there two years ago and got there early and there was no one there yet. So I wandered through the uh, graveyard and came across seven almost identical markers. And I began looking at the names and dates and every one of these markers has the same last name and they all died on the same day. This made national news a few years ago, 2011, when an Amish farmer was out in the middle of the night delivering milk and his wife was in the barn milking a cow and one of the kids ran out of the house and said, Mama, the house is on fire. And seven children between six months and 11 years old in that family died in the fire on the same day. And when that made national news, people raised the question they always do in times of suffering, how can there be a God? Who would allow this kind of thing? What kind of God would let the world become this way? And the truth is there is all kinds of suffering in our world to the point that if you're aware of it, it is simply staggering. The, the genocide that is committed, the natural disasters that are done, the, the evil that has been brought upon humanity that humanity brings upon itself is overwhelming. And we have never lived in a time quite like this where we can know within minutes of an event happening all around the world to know about and to see the scenes of what's going on. And this rightly bothers people. It ought to bother people. We ought to be raising the question that the psalmist does all through the Psalms. How long, O Lord, will this continue? Help, O Lord, save, deliver. This is a difficult objection that's raised. C.S. Lewis, the great British philosopher, theologian, literary figure, uh, wrote this in one of his books. When you're so happy, so happy you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him, talking about God, with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain. And what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? Lewis wrote this after his new bride, his wife, uh, died of cancer. If you read the book of Grief Observed, it's heart-wrenching. And maybe you've experienced that kind of thing. Maybe you know what it is to endure great pain, endure loss, maybe loss upon loss, suffering at the hands of some other evil person, suffering sickness. This world is full of evil and suffering, and it raises the good question, how can God be good? So what we want to do, if you have the handout from this weekend, I want to break it down. Here's how we answer those who ask us this problem. Now, there is an internal theological answer if we were just Christians talking about how do we figure this out. The Bible is rich with explanation of the character of God, the workings of God, which help us understand why God does this. But when you're talking to someone who doesn't know Christ, how do we answer this objection? It's a tough one. And what we need to do is begin by examining the assumptions behind this question. So that great final scene, or one of the final scenes from The Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy and her company arrive, and they see the wizard, and he yells at them, tells them, I'm not giving you anything, and go away. And Toto runs over and pulls the curtain back. And The Wizard of Oz is really just a little old man pressing buttons and pulling levers. And suddenly, that which seems so awful and terrible is reduced and diminished and disappears. When people ask this question, sometimes as Christians, we don't know how to respond, and that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. But I wanna start by noticing the assumptions in this question. First of all, it assumes that suffering is necessarily bad. That is, this question of how can there be so much evil and suffering in the world, when Christians claim that there's an all-powerful, all-loving God, it assumes that suffering is bad. But think with me for a moment. If the Christian God doesn't exist, let's take the worldview of evolution. 
if this world came about through blind time and chance, through natural processes that are unguided by any intelligence, the question I have to ask is why is suffering bad? Natural selection works by eliminating the weak, the strong overpower the weak. Therefore, when trouble happens, when tragedy happens, when people die, they get sick. If I'm a consistent evolutionist, I should stand up and applaud natural selection. But no one does, do they? When people lose someone close to them, they grieve. When great tragedy happens, we ask, why, God? And the reason is because we're made in the image of God. And we cannot escape the, the reality that deep down inside we feel that that's not the way it's supposed to be. And that feeling is correct. The world is not the way it's supposed to be. But if you believe in natural selection, it's exactly the way it's supposed to be. They're supposed to be suffering. The strong is supposed to defeat the weak. We don't go out in the Serengeti and say, why, oh Lord, the zebras are dying at the hands of the lions. We know that's the way it's supposed to be because that is brute nature. And yet, even those who would want to deny God think there should be meaning, this should make sense, and it doesn't. Notice another assumption. People assume that they are basically innocent so that suffering is somehow unfair. How could this happen to me? I mean, haven't we all said this before? <laughs> Lord, I'm trying to be a good person here and you're making it really hard. Or Lord, I, I've, I've already told you that I'll give you my life and I'll serve you and, and why are you bringing difficulty? In other words, we tend to think that we're good and, and in the world at large, people question why I don't deserve this kind of suffering. It's also assumed that suffering and evil cannot result in good that make them worthwhile. That is, sometimes we think that suffering is always bad, and yet look at the case of Johnny Erickson Tata, if you've heard of her before. A Christian girl at the age of 17 was diving into a lake, hit her head, broke her neck, and became a quadriplegic. And we just passed the 50th anniversary of her accident last year. And yet the fruit of this woman's life, helping literally millions of disabled people around the world, influencing governments, bringing relief, bringing supplies to disabled people around the world, has been an incredible blessing. And so we tend to think suffering can bring no good, and yet it clearly can in this world. It also assumes a number of other things. It assumes that there is a difference between good and evil. When a skeptic, for example, someone who has no religious commitment, doesn't believe in God, says to me, how can there be evil, or how can there be a good, loving God, powerful God, when there's evil and the suffering in the world? I tend to say, what do you mean by evil? And they say, you know, bad things. I say, well, I don't know what you mean by bad things in your worldview. And I ask them, would you distinguish between good and bad? Because there is a there's a difference between good and bad that they're assuming, and they would say, oh yeah, there are some things good, some things bad. And I say, well, how do you tell the difference? In other words, that question assumes a moral law by which to judge evil and suffering. And then they say, well, you know, we, we all know that some things are right and some things are wrong. And I say, how do we know that? So they assume that this moral law ought to be known and ought to compel people. Like, have you ever said to someone, you shouldn't do that? If they were really tricky, they'd turn around and say, why not? Well, the rules are against it. Well, who made the rules? You know, when your kids are young, who made you the boss, right? And all you gotta do is say those magic words, mom said, that's it. But this question assumes that there's some moral law that we all ought to know and ought to compel us. But if there is no God, my question is, where's this moral law coming from? And it also assumes that there is meaning to the events in the world and to the suffering of people. Folks, if, if there is no God, Suffering has no meaning. That's just the way the world works. But here's an interesting thing about apologetics is it teaches that we cannot avoid our humanity. Our humanity says, no, it, it should mean something. I want to make sense of it. And hence we ask the big question, why? Why, God? We want a reason. The three-year-old that's forced to eat broccoli wants to know why. <laughs> right? You like broccoli? He's terrified that I spoke to him, so I'll just go on, okay? It's like, why is that man looking at me? We, we know that the parent, no matter how try, hard they try to explain to the three-year-old nutrition and all that, they don't get it. And yet every one of us, when we go through difficult times, pain, loss, suffering, death, 
evil at the hands of someone else. We ask God the question, why? Because we want an explanation. Different types of people have tried to answer this question. Um, For example, some believe in the non-reality of evil view. That is, they would say evil and suffering are nothing more than an illusion. Buddhism tells you that suffering is an illusion and you will reach enlightenment once you begin to shed yourself of the idea that suffering exists or that you exist apart from the universe. Uh, I have a skeptic friend uh, who lives in the same town I do. He's the co-founder of the Pennsylvania Skeptics Conference, which gathers skeptics from all over the state every year. He told me he doesn't believe in good and evil. He's got two small children. I said, so if someone did something horrible to them, you, you wouldn't say that was wrong? He'd say, no, uh, but we've learned as a society that empathy makes for better society, so I would say, well, that's not empathetic. And I want to say to him, you liar. Of course you know that's wrong. Of course you would think that's evil or that's something you should not do. We cannot escape the fact that evil exists, that suffering exists. If you don't believe suffering exists, come up to me afterward. I'm going to ask you to put your thumb there while I grab a hammer and say, okay, one more time. Does pain exist? Does suffering Because We know that it, in fact, does exist. Some people hold to the weakness of God view, that God would like to help. He really would, but he can't. He doesn't have the power. He's too tired from creating the world and can't interfere. Along with that, some would hold the free will view is that God cannot interfere with man's free will without impinging on it. In other words, God would love to help you, but he doesn't want to step in and overstep his boundaries, so he's going to have to just let people do what they do. And that sounds good, and it does relieve some theological tensions, but as soon as you open the Bible, you realize God impinges on our free will all the time. Think about Paul's conversion. He's on his way to persecute more Christians. That was his life's goal. And Christ appears before him, throws him off his horse, and confronts him. When you were saved, it's not because... You put two and two together, it was logical, Jesus made sense, sign me up. No, it's because the Holy Spirit began to convict you of your sinfulness, of your guilt, of your uh, tenuous position in the wrath of God. And then he opened your eyes to see Christ, and in faith, you repented of your sin, you responded to Christ. God broke through. Think about what happens when we ask God to save someone. Lord, please save my friend. But don't impinge on his free will, God. Just somehow do that. No, we're asking God to open his eyes, to see his sinfulness apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. That will never happen. Sin, we love our sin in the unsaved state. But God interferes, shows us Christ, and we respond in faith. This is what I was taught growing up, Christian fatalism. Listen, just keep your emotions steady. Don't get too excited. Don't get too upset. Uh, This comes from Stoicism in the ancient Greek philosophical world. And the Stoic idea is making a comeback. There's a lot of bestsellers right now on the New York Times bestsellers list that talk about all the things we can learn from Stoicism. But Stoicism, rather than promoting a biblical understanding of, of emotion, says just be steady. And so I was kind of taught growing up whether my teachers and preachers intended to or not. When you encounter suffering, don't let it get you upset. Just stoically accept it. It's a blessing, sister. It's actually a blessing. Don't cry about it. But that is so devoid of real emotion. And sometimes we think, well, you know, God just sits back and he's not too concerned with our lives. But I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 11 so we can see how God really responds to our suffering. Because when Jesus came, he came to show us the Father. Remember Philip asked him one time after he's been with Jesus for several years, Hey, Lord, it's been great being with you. We've seen some amazing things. But could you just show us the Father? I mean, could you just reveal God and Jesus, you know, palm plants like Peter. I'm sorry, Philip. Don't you know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Don't you know that my whole purpose in coming is to show you who God is? And in John chapter 11, we see how God responds to evil and suffering. John 11, beginning in verse 17 The story is that Jesus has good friends, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, brothers and sisters. And Lazarus is sick and he's going to die. And Jesus waits until he dies and he comes to Martha and Mary. John 11, 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. 
Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to see where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Notice Mary says the same exact thing as Martha. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? In this passage, we have God's concern for our suffering displayed. So as you know, Jesus shows up on the scene and Martha comes first and she says, Lord, if you'd been here, you could have prevented. Why didn't you is, is implied in the sentence. And Jesus' response is, your brother will rise again. This is not the end, Martha. This suffering is not the end of, of your relationship with Lazarus. God will raise him up. And, uh, G- and Mary, Martha's response is, I know someday in the future an event will take place. And Jesus says, no, I am the event. I am the resurrection. And he gives her what we would call a ministry of truth. Martha needed help understanding the situation. So Jesus gives her truth and says, the resurrection is not a future event. It's a person. And I have arrived. I always wondered why Jesus didn't kind of saunter into town, calm down everybody, I'm here, you know, shazam, and Lazarus comes out of the tomb, because that's what Jesus is about to do, right? He's gonna raise him from the dead. But notice Mary comes to Jesus, she says the same thing, and Jesus responds differently. Mary's weeping and says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died, and Jesus' response is to weep. He didn't sniffle. He didn't get misty eyes. He wept. In the ancient Jewish world, weeping was loud, wailing and moaning in sorrow. See, that shows the heart of God, that when you're going through difficulty, when you're suffering, when someone you love is dying, when you're enduring high school, can we be honest, one of the worst times in life, when you're enduring that, when you get a bad report. I was in my late 30s when I went to the doctor for a blood test, and uh, for cholesterol, because I thought I probably ought to start paying attention to that. And they came back and said, Mark, you have end-stage renal disease, and you're going to need a kidney transplant within the year. I was like, you must have missed out the blood test. I'm doing fine. I can still dunk a basketball. So you must be wrong. They said, no, you're, you're very sick. <laughs> you don't know it. Your blood pressure was really high, which I did know, but didn't think that was important. And uh, I got really sick over the next few years, and they were able to hold off my transplant. But eight years ago, my brother-in-law donated his kidney. And uh, within a day of the operation, I felt better than I'd felt in years. I'm in good health now. But I don't know why God brought that into my life. It was really difficult those last few years. I was teaching full-time, working on my doctorate, coaching my kids in sports. And my wife lived with the constant thought that I could die And uh, I think she suffered in some ways more than I did because of the fear of what will happen. And I don't know why God brought that into our lives, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. The things God worked in my life through that suffering were priceless. And here in this story, uh, Mary is brokenhearted and Jesus shows her, here's how God feels about your suffering. Jesus weeps. 
even though he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. That's how God cares about suffering in this world. Some people say, well, why doesn't God just wipe out all the evil in the world? It's because evil is not an atmospheric condition. It's not like smog. Evil resides in the human heart. So if God were to wipe out all the evil, he'd wipe out every one of us. But God has done just the opposite of that. He's given us Jesus, who died on the cross, rose again to pay for our sins so that we can be finally fully freed from evil and suffering when we see him. So with Mary, he gives a ministry of tears. And when you're talking to someone who doesn't know Christ, it says, I could not believe in God. He took my sister. He allowed my friend to suffer a terrible accident. I'm sick, I'm dying. What about all the injustice in the world? What about all the evil in the world? We need to ask ourselves, does this person need an explanation or do they just need me to sit with them and express sympathy? A lot of times I'll say to someone, I don't know why God's allowed this into your life, but I do know this is that God cares. And truthfully, the only two choices we have with the problem of evil and the suffering in the world is either there is no God and your suffering doesn't mean anything because that's just the way natural selection works. And whatever angst you have and whatever sorrow you have, that's just a misfiring of your brain because that's all you are, is your DNA working together. In which case, you've got to learn not to cry over things. In other words, you've got to subdue your humanity to deal with it that way. Or you can say, I don't know why God allowed this, but I know he knows more than I do, and I'm going to rest my fate, I'm going to rest my life, in his hands and trust him. Otherwise, I have to say, none of this matters. None of this means anything. So notice on the back of your handout, if you have it, what is a Christian answer to this problem? Let me look at a few Christian answers which help us work through this. First of all, God is the standard for his actions. Some people think, well, there's justice up here, there's goodness up here, and God has to measure up. So if God does something or allows something, he's got to explain this gap. But that's not the way it worked. That comes from a, an ancient Greek philosopher named Plato. But the way it works actually is whatever God does defines justice, defines goodness. God doesn't have to explain himself or defend his actions to us. In the book of Job, as you know, Job is this righteous man of his day. God praises him for being a faithful, righteous man, and yet God allows great suffering into his life. And halfway through the book in Job 23, Job asks for a trial date. He says, God, I want to put you on the stand and I want to cross-examine you as a hostile witness because I have proof that I do not deserve this. But as the book goes on, God begins to reveal his greatness, his power, his eternal plan, things that Job cannot comprehend. And at the end of the book, Job says, I put my hand over my mouth because I've spoken out of turn. I thought God was like a man. I thought God had limited understanding and had to explain himself, but I've come to realize God is so much greater than me that I can't ask of him answers because I don't know how to process those. And notice, thirdly, we cannot comprehend the reasons of an infinite, perfect, uncreated God. When I was in seventh grade, I got my first calculator. It was high tech. You know, you high school students that have your you know, your iPhones and Wii's and X, you have no idea how amazing a calculator was in 1977. It was pretty impressive. And I remember getting it, bringing it to school. It only cost like $400, you know. Calculator's really cheap then. And I brought in, gathered all the friends around, hey, try two plus two. Four, it works. Let's go really seven times seven. 49. I know, it was really sad life in the 70s. You have no idea what you have. But think about it. What if I tried to take that calculator from the 70s and download the operating system of a supercomputer? It would crash. It could not possibly comprehend it. And this is the problem. We demand answers of God for his eternal, infinite, wise mind. We're asking God to explain something to us that we cannot possibly comprehend. Now, I think when we get to heaven and eternity, God will explain, here's why I did all these things in your life. And I promise we will always say, you, O Lord, are good. You, O Lord, are wise. Just like a three-year-old that can't understand broccoli, we can't understand 
the suffering God brings into this world. And we should not attribute to God the suffering that humans bring upon themselves. I can either trust in a God who says, I will be the anchor of your soul, the shepherd, uh, the, the one who protects you and takes care of you, or you live in a radically uncertain world and nothing you go through matters, doesn't mean anything. I think intuitively as humans made in God's image, we long for meaning because there is meaning even though we may not know why it is. An even better answer here is that Christians understand that God may have a perfectly good reason for allowing evil. The standard atheistic view developed hundreds of years ago by Scottish philosopher David Hume says, not that there's not enough evidence for God, but he pins the argument against God on this issue of evil and suffering. And the argument assumes that God could not possibly have a reason that we don't understand. But we need to realize that with man's limited understanding, we cannot know whether or not God has good reasons. And based on all the God promises God gives us in the scripture, he encourages us by faith to trust him. And here's the big issue. If God took care of my biggest need, see my biggest need is not physical health. My biggest need is not freedom from suffering or difficulty. My biggest need is to be made right with God because I'm a guilty sinner, separated from him because of my sin, headed toward eternal wrath. My biggest problem is not the immediate here and now. My biggest problem is relationship with God. And he has taken care of that. God took care of that when Christ came and died on the cross. And if he's taking care of that, won't he take care of me through difficulty and suffering? We don't always know why. Uh, it's 12 years ago yesterday, my mom died after a car accident. She had just moved to be near us in Pennsylvania. She was a young 62 years old, which now seems really young because I'm in my 50s, but for you young people in your teens, it's like, whoa. It's too far. I don't even know if I want to live that long. I know. I thought that way too. But my mom was young. She was actively involved in the lives of my kids and my niece and nephews. And one day she was on her way to come to pick up my wife to go shopping, and she never showed. And she crossed a busy road in her car in a work truck, just T-boned her. She was unconscious. They flew her to the University of Pennsylvania in a helicopter. We got down there, waited seven hours while she went through emergency brain surgery in the Neurosurgeon came out and said, we're just gonna have to wait and see. We don't know what's gonna happen. At the time, I was teaching a graduate level bioethics course on end of life issues. And I was having to live it. We waited five days, sat by her bed, a lot of muscle twitches. We thought maybe she's waking up, but after five days, the surgeon came in and said, there's no brain activity. Your mom will never wake up and you have one of two choices. You can either put her in a nursing home on the ventilator and eventually she'll catch pneumonia and die, or you can remove life support from her and let her go. And we agonize, like, Lord, this does not make sense. We made the decision to remove life support and let her go, and so 12 years ago, yesterday, she died. And to this day, none of us know why God did that. And the truth is, much of the suffering and pain and loss you experience in your life, it's not going to make sense. But as I said, you have the choice either to trust a loving, powerful God who says, I don't do anything without a reason, or you live in a radically uncertain world and none of that matters anyway. See, the Christian answer validates that suffering is genuine, yet not meaningless. And in this passage, we see that God grieves over evil and suffering. Jesus weeps, but notice there's also a very interesting phrase in verse 33. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again. This, ver this word in Greek literally means he bellowed in anger. He went, ah! Because he was grieving over the curse of sin which rests on this world. Because that's not the way God made the world. God made the world perfect. Adam and Eve brought a curse, and we live under that curse, and we inherit original sin from Adam and Eve. We too are sinners. And yet God does not leave us in a curse. He does not leave us in unbelief. He sends Jesus to die for us. But God grieves over suffering. And God himself experienced the greatest suffering 
in order to ensure an end. In other words, what Jesus did on the cross took care of our biggest problem, our eternal destiny, our separation from God, so that when a person repents and believes in Christ, that is made clean, that is made clear. And no matter what else we suffer, this is the comfort of the Christian, no matter what we endure in this lifetime, we know that when we close our eyes in death, that we open them in eternal bliss because of what Christ has done for us, not because of what we have done. Ultimately then, only the Christian worldview has grounds to call evil what it is, to see evil as really destructive and as awful as it is, and to provide hope for future judgment on those who perpetrate evil. By the way, if you you believe in just a, a godless world evolution, no one who does wrong will ever be punished for it. Oh, you could try to sneak karma in there, but now you're really not really skeptical anymore. God says, I will judge evildoers. Those people in the world who do horrendous things, who bring evil upon people, or who is just simply sin and rebel by saying, I don't need Jesus, I can get to God on my own. God will deal with those someday. God hates evil and has nothing to do with it. We don't have a world in which there is a yin and yang, you know, the dark side and the, and the light side of Star Wars. We, we don't have a world. We have a world of an eternal, perfect, holy God who hates evil and will someday do away with it because evil is the enemy of God and all he has made. And God will someday put down his enemies. Non-Christian views minimize evil. They reduce, my, my skeptical friend says, oh, I think the world's getting better. I'm like, what are you reading? Open your eyes. Ultimately, God overcame evil by the death of his son. So what do I do when I encounter someone who raises this question? First of all, always show sympathy. Say, I I really don't know why God allowed it. I am so sorry that you're going through that, that you suffered the loss of that loved one, that you're enduring that difficulty at work or the difficulty of your marriage. Show that you care, because Christ cares. And then say, I don't know why God's allowing, but I do know he cares, and can I show you the heart of Christ? Take them to John 11. Show them that God cares, but also show them you have a greater need than just the suffering. You need to be made right with God, and Jesus provided that for us. And my friend, there is no greater answer, because the Bible says someday God will make all things right. I'm so thankful for that. And on those who put their faith in Christ, God will show mercy. If you're a believer, you will never suffer the just wrath of God because Christ took that for you. And we need to spread the good news of the gospel of Christ and be able to answer these questions because this is the reality in a broken world. Are you ready to give an answer? Let's bow our heads and pray. God, we're so thankful for the truth of your word, for Jesus who came and settled our debt with you. And I pray that you would make us vocal sharers of the good news of Jesus. It is good news. This world is not the end. Someday you will make all things right and you desire that all people come to repentance. Help us, Father, to care enough to open our mouths and speak, to share the good news that souls who are struggling, people who are suffering might find in Jesus the good shepherd who cares for them. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.